As I was heading to the radio station this morning, I was listening to KMJ and the fellow who was speaking on the Commonwealth Club. And he made this statement. The future is so bright for me and for my family and for all of us. We ought to be very excited about what the future brings. I thought, I don't know where this guy's been. But the last time I checked the headlines, things are kind of grim. I've had two or three people come this morning and say thank you for prayer being offered for those that are in the Middle East because I've got a kid sitting on a ship out there somewhere in the Persian Gulf. I've got a kid that's on land somewhere, I don't know where. Others that are in the process of being called up. Uh, if we are insensitive to that, and if we want to refuse to believe that there is a major crisis going on, not just with what's happening there, that points up to some things more vividly than a lot of other things do. But when you think about crime that's going on that we hear about every day to where we just get callous to it. When you hear about the drug problem. Some guy told me in jest the other day, he heard that Marion Barry was running for mayor of Philadelphia because he heard there's crack in the Liberty Bell. You know, that's the kind of thing that goes on out there. And we get to where it's easier to laugh about it because we can't do anything. We don't even understand how does this goofy system work? But it does. It does weird and strange things. Think about the disintegrating families that are out there. I saw a TV show this week, never seen one quite like this in my life. These people have done research and now they are teaching married couples how to fight. Well, how to fight fair is what they're trying to do, get them to fight fair. And they're claiming that they are going to reduce the divorce rate dramatically because they're gonna teach these people how to fight. It would seem like that it'd be a good idea to teach them how to love one another rather than how to go to war in a better way. Now, there, there's, there are some better ways to go to war than other ways. And the kinds of explosions that go on in families that tear things up. But when you think about what's happening as the family continues to get in more and more stress. We are doing a, a new thing around here. It's a, it's a program that we found. And there was a training session ran all day yesterday for a bunch of our folks, a thing called Rainbows, which is a support system for kids who have been caught in some kind of major situation that they could not control and that they do not understand through divorce, through death, through abandonment. See, we live in such a nice little world of our own choosing that we don't even acknowledge that people just walk off and leave kids. And here's a kid, eight, nine years old. He can't figure out what's happening. He just walked off and left him. And we think nobody could do that. They're doing it every day, folks. And then you throw into that the Mideast situation. And I'm being asked by people every day because, see, pastors are supposed to know all of this. What do you think's going on? Well, a lot of bad stuff. That's my first answer. A lot of bad stuff is going on. But what they want me to do is pick up the Bible and say, now let me tell you what it says in the Word of God concerning what's happening right now in the Persian Gulf. Hey, friend, I don't know. I grew up in a church where our pastor had all the answers to that. And he found out a lot of his answers didn't fit in with the script as they kept writing the script. They didn't fit. He had the wrong guy pegged to be the Antichrist. He had all kinds of things he was messed up on. And God has not called me to put the finger on the Antichrist or to give the kind of leadership to folks that begin to kind of let the saliva drool when they think about prophecy and get excited about all of that. I'm gonna tell you what I found early on in my Christian life as a kid. I watched it in a church where a pastor preached prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. Man, we had those charts that strung all across and started in with Genesis and ended out here at the end. And the big part of the chart was out here at the end because they were gonna tell us everything that's gonna happen just ahead of us. And I saw in that place 
that the fervor to bring people to Christ was not stirred by telling them all of this stuff because we get interested in all the stuff. And we forget what our responsibility is today. What am I doing today? When people are asking me, what do I think is going on? I say, I think it's a marvelous opportunity for us to tell people about Jesus Christ. He's the only answer. Now let's get busy. That isn't the answer folks want to hear from me. They want something exciting. Like that Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist. Now if you go out here and say that I said he was the Antichrist, <laughs> then buddy, you were sleeping at a part where you should have been awake. That's not what I said. People want you to do something exciting like that and then they go away and say, boy, that's the play. You all ought to get over here because he's telling us what the real news is. I'm going to tell you what the real news is this morning. The real news is that we need to pay attention to what the Word of God says we ought to be doing in times like these. 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's where we're going to be this morning. I had Russ read that uh, section out of Matthew 24 because that gives us great backdrop. That ties right into 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Paul writes here to Timothy in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said, you may as well know this, Timothy, that in the last days it is going to be very difficult to be a Christian. How you like that for good news? Aren't you glad you got up and came to church? In the last days it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. Why? Well, Part of what he wants to do here is stir old Timothy up. I kind of picture Timothy as a guy that knew how to really relax and be laid back. Because time and again, Paul comes in here with a big stir stick of some kind and he really lays it to him. Like a lot of believers I know, just lay back and relax, everything's gonna be okay. And Paul jumps in here and says, look, look Tim, you need to be stirred up, you need to get it straight that in the last time, tough days are coming. One translation that I read said, in the last days, savage times will come. I don't know what words do to you, but that word savage brings a really strong picture to my mind. Savage times will come. There's some kind of wildness, some kind of unpredictability. Things are going to really get out of hand and that's gonna, gonna happen in the last days. And he goes on to say, why? People will love only themselves and their money. Has there ever been a time on planet Earth when people have more, been more in love with themselves and their money? Well, you gotta wear all the right labels, man. If you're not wearing the right labels on your shorts and your shoes and your socks and your shirts, you gotta have all those right labels. You gotta be able to open your coat and it's gotta say the right thing in there. You gotta continually flaunt what you have. People are in love themselves and their money. And then he says, they'll be proud and boastful. And they'll sneer at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful to them and thoroughly bad. They will be hard-headed and never give in to others. People become irreconcilable. We are at a point in the history of this country, and, and don't be offended if this happens to be your profession. You know who you are and how you conduct yourself in your business. There are lawyers on every corner and 14 in between in this country, and all of them are working, why? Because people don't want to be reconciled, they want to go to war, I'm gonna sue you, I'll take you to court. That's all their stuff goes over and over and over again. And people don't want to settle a dispute. They want to extend the thing and fight and scrap and carry on. And they do it in all kinds of situations. As you know, I'm a, I'm a sports freak. I think about these guys that are up there making incredible amounts of money, but they want their contract renegotiated because they need more money. Why? Because one of the other guys got more money. And they don't want to settle with the team and say, you know, you're, you're paying me two million bucks a year and I have to play 162 games for that and I gotta go to spring training a little while and, and um, two mil is enough, thanks a lot. Those guys would drop dead if some guy walked in and said, that's plenty. You don't need to open my new, con why? We gotta, we, gotta, we gotta have more. 
Is there anybody in this place thinks they could spend $2 million in one year? I don't think I could if I tried. And here guys scratching and grubbing and you gotta rewrite it and I gotta have more. And Man, I'm getting short change. You guys giving me the shaft and you're not gonna do this and get away with it? The thing it pictures to us is this obsession with things and the great desire for old number one to get ahead. Hard-headed, never giving in to others. And then he says they'll be constant liars and troublemakers and they'll think nothing of immorality. They'll be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to be good. They will betray their friends. They will be hot-headed, puffed up with pride, and prefer good times to worshiping God. They will go to church, yes, but they really won't believe anything they hear. I read that in the book, and I have to think, we got folks here who show up, know how to stand up at the right time, sit down at the right time, Turn to the right page, but don't believe anything they hear? Could be. I don't want to believe that's true. I want to believe that every one of you that are here are here because you want to learn and you want to understand more of what it means to walk with God. What it means to invest your life and to take the wise step of investing this thing we have for such a short period of time and investing it to the glory of God. Good for us to stop and say, what am I doing with my life? Boy, do I believe what I hear when I go in there? You see, there is aggressive opposition to the truth of God. They, he just says, don't be taken in by people like that. They're the kind who craftily sneak into other people's homes make friendships with silly, sin-burdened women and teach them their new doctrines. Women of that kind are forever following new teachers, but they never understand the truth. And these teachers fight truth just as Janus and Jambres fought against Moses. One of the interesting things, I've been reading a, a book this week that Mitch recommended to me. It's called Men of Strength for Women of God. And one of the things this fellow talked about, and he's a guy who, uh, who wrote an answer to Shirley MacLaine's book some years ago. Uh, Out on a Broken Limb was the name of Lagarde Smith's book. One of the things that Smith points out, the amazing number of women that are involved in all kinds of new age activity and teaching. Gals, don't be upset with me, it's just a fact. The women are giving great leadership to that kind of thing. Detouring around Jesus Christ. Telling people you can be God. And he makes this statement out of the Old Testament. These teachers aggressively oppose the truth just as Janus and Jambres. Who are they? They're a couple of magicians that were down in Egypt when Moses came in to tell Pharaoh, let my people go, and every time Moses would do some kind of a trick through God's power, these would counter with the power of Satan. Ultimately, Moses exposed them and defeated them, just as it says, they have dirty minds, warped and twisted, and have turned against the Christian faith. A part of what we see and what's happening in New Age thinking is always they try to ally themselves with the scriptures just a little bit. They'll quote a little. They'll touch a little here and touch a little there. But the truth is, they've turned against the Christian faith. <coughs> they won't get away with this forever. Someday their deceit will be well known to everyone, as was the sin of Janus and Jambres. The people, judgment day is coming. There's going to be a day when things are going to be set straight. And it's good for us to look at the scriptures in order to know that that day already is in process. It's just a matter of waiting for it to get here because as surely as we are here, it will take place against those who oppose the truth of God. 
And then he says two things. These are two things I want to leave with you today. You know from watching me, Timothy, that I'm not that kind of person. You know what I believe and the way I live and what I want. You know my faith in Christ and how I have suffered. You know my love for you and my patience. You know how many troubles I have had as a result of my preaching the good news. Now, when you look at that kind of statement from Paul and think about your own life, ask yourself this question. Am I a role model for anyone in my Christian life? Am I aggressively walking with God because I understand I am someone's role model? I have role models. I have men that I believe in. Some are older, some are younger. But men that really help me because as I look at their lives, they challenge me to walk with God. I, I hope you've got some of those in your life. Unfortunately, we live in a time where heroes and role models have been systematically destroyed our history, we, we've gotten to where we, we just kind of rejected our history and rejected the people and dug around to find something on all of these people so that nobody can look at anybody from George Washington on down and find anybody that's a real role model. I hope you've got a role model somewhere. Paul says, son, you know who I am. You know I'm not that kind of person. You know what I believe and you know the way I live, and you know what I want. We had a great celebration in here at 10 o'clock Thursday morning. Tommy Avent, one of our men in this church, died on a golf course. And I had the privilege of handling that service. Molly and some of her family were here in the early service. But it was a great time of really speaking to lots of men about the importance of their faith. See, Tommy knew where his faith was. He had made an open commitment concerning his faith. He did not share that faith in words. It was in the demonstration of his life. But in his death, we shared that in words with, with people. And I believe God is going to do a great deal of ministry through that. I would encourage you to get to where you openly share your faith with people that come your way. Some of us are very private. We close off certain areas. I, I can't talk about that. I would pray you would open yourself to talk about that. Oh, Paul, he said, you know all about the things that were done to me while I was visiting in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, but the Lord delivered me. Hey, what, what was done to him? They drug him out of town because they'd thrown rocks at him and figured they'd killed him and they drug him out and left him lay outside of town under this pile of rocks. Guy got up and went to the next town and started preaching some more. You know, it kind of sounded like maybe he got one too many rocks in the head because it, you'd think it'd be time to say, you know what, I, I've had enough. I've done my share. I'm going to let the younger guys handle it now. Not Paul. He got up and went to the next town, preached some more. He said, yes. Now listen to this, people. You a believer? Are you a Christian? Listen to this. Yes. And those who decide to please Christ Jesus by living godly lives will suffer at the hands of those who hate Jesus Christ. People, we are living more and more in an American society that cannot stand Jesus Christ. We don't like to acknowledge that. We want to pull away from that. We want to get in our little secure place with our little secure family and our little secure Christian family and say that isn't true, but it is. It is. And those who decide to please Christ Jesus by living godly lives, have you made that decision? Will suffer at the hands of those who hate Jesus Christ. 
In fact, evil men and false teachers will become worse and worse, deceiving many, they themselves having been deceived by Satan. We need to pay attention and follow models that are worthy of following. The Apostle Paul's been one of my models all of my Christian life. But I have some real live living models that I look to for help and for strength and for encouragement in the work of getting the gospel out. Secondly, he tells them one other thing. Timothy, you must keep on believing the things you've been taught. You know they're true, for you know that you can trust those of us who have taught you. You know how when you were a small child, you were taught the Holy Scriptures, and it is these that make you wise to accept God's salvation by trusting in Christ Jesus. His mother and his grandmother laid a tremendous foundation according to the Scripture. And then Paul came along and really solidified all of the things they had taught him and was a part of projecting him into the ministry. People, we must consistently return to the truth that we have been taught and we must consistently be teaching the truth to children. There is no place else they're going to learn it. Why do we take the 11 o'clock hour and turn it into kind of a, of a different kind of thing because we've been working all week with about 500 kids to teach them the word of God. Oh, we've had peaches and peanut butter and crackers and all kinds of stuff and games and all that stuff. That's all a means to the end, to teach them the word of God. And they're going to be here singing the word of God in this next hour. We will stay faithful to the responsibility to teach people the scriptures because we believe that the whole Bible, verse 16, was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us do what is right. It is God's way of making us well prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. Why do I talk to you about our kids in this place and talk to you about a place of service, an opportunity for you to share something with them? Because that's an important place for you to be. To not just learn it, but give it away. And I look at this whole chapter and I go back to where he started. Remember, savage times are coming. Folks, they're here. They're here. It's much more important for me to talk to you out of this chapter about what we need to be doing with our lives than it is to try to come and give you some indicator as to exactly what the next move is going to be in the Middle East. Only a fool would try to tell you what the next move is going to be out there. But see, we're bombarded every day. Bombarded by the news. Some folks I know should never watch the news because they get too upset. Remember, Russ prayed, said a little phrase that I really loved. He said, help us to remember, God, that you're in control. He is. Boy, Satan's running on a long leash. But God's still in control. And he never designed any of us to take the pressure of trying to shoulder the burden of all that's happening in this world. That's his job, not ours. I have a recommendation to make to you for this week. I'm not going to assign you a chapter to read. I just have a recommendation. And I know that some people say, you're absolutely naive. You make some assignments up there that anybody with a brain in their head knows people aren't going to do. But here's my assignment for this week. If you're watching the news and it upsets you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to match minute for minute. Time in the Word with the time you spend watching the news. Some of you are absolutely CNN freaks. Can't live without CNN. You want to hear all the bad stuff you can get. 
and you have no concept of what that's doing to you. So here's what I want you to do. You sit down and watch a 30 minute newscast, shut that thing off, pick up your Bible and say to yourself, I've just watched 30 minutes of news. You can deduct the commercials if you like. So you've watched 18 minutes of news, 12 minutes of commercial. Take that same amount of time to open the word. Read something like Romans 8. There's no condemnation to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And nothing can separate us from his love. Read Romans 5. Get over in the Psalms. Read 23, 24, 26, 90, 91, 92, 103. Marvelous. Just match minute for minute this week, just this week. I won't ask you to do this again next week. Just do it this week and see what happens in your own life. Read it out loud. See, you don't read lip, lip read the guys on TV. You got that volume up. Got to hear everything that these guys are saying. Read, read out loud. It will triple the impact in your own life. Match it minute for minute. Just this week. Father, help us, we pray, with the courage to pick up on an assignment even though we may think deep down he's a little crazy to ask us to do that. Not realistic. Lord, I just ask that we have the courage to trust you and make a move that's significant. There are folks in this place that need help and they don't really know how to ask for it we try not to pry and poke at folks in this place. We put a little yellow slip in the pew and ask them to fill it out. We want to know they're here and want to know what kind of needs they have that we might help them meet. So we pray you'd bless us with enough courage to acknowledge I, I need to talk to somebody about Jesus. I need to talk to somebody about baptism. I've got a problem in my home that's overwhelming me. I pray that you would help us to be honest enough to indicate our needs and then give us on this staff the wisdom to know how to come to you to meet those needs. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Take that yellow slip. There's one side for regular attendees. They can just put their name on. And if there's something you need, write down that need for us, please. On the flip side, for visitors, and whatever your need might be, write it down and let us help you. Let us help you. We don't know all the answers, but I'm going to tell you what, folks. I was with a pastor yesterday that told me, he said, you know, I, I know a little of your activity in the community, and two months ago I was going to call you because I had a lady in my church, I knew that she had a drinking problem and knew she needed help and didn't know how to help her. And I know you're involved with Jim Maloney and the Alcoholism Council and I just put off two weeks ago, 33 years old, two young children, she died. He said, I just got jolted realizing I hadn't done what I needed to do. If you'll ask for help, folks, so many times when we get in a place where we need help, we get paralyzed, can't make a move, shake loose from the paralysis and ask for a little help. Pass those in to the end, men will pick them up and maybe just lay them at the end of the pew or something. God bless you. Hope to see you somewhere along the way this week. Thank you. Thank you.